Hi everyone, welcome to another video of Coin Crunch India. We have with us again Rajshri Maitra, and he's here to talk about the new uh, soft fork that happened on the Bitcoin net network. It's called the Taproot, and a lot of people have been asking us the question about what Taproot is. And while I may be able to explain it, but who better than someone who's working on open source technology, open source Bitcoin development? uh then uh, to explain this particular uh, upgrade so raj thank you so much for joining uh, welcome to coin crunch once again hey thanks man thanks for having me again uh, it's going to be fun we are going to talk about some deep magical shits and uh, magic yeah. internet money and how it is being improved <laughs> yes yes and everything <laughs> is magic about this money here so yeah, let's get right into it so yes. uh so basically uh, two three days back taproot the soft fork uh, got activated into uh, into into the bitcoin protocol the code has been uh, like in review for last uh, i guess uh, one one and a half years uh, okay. the bip has been written there are three bips that describe this protocol bip 3 340 bip 341 and bip 342 together right. all these three bip describes a package upgrade change that we call as step root right. and there are two basically two specific uh, upgrade that are happening with these changes one is we are getting snort signature so this is one bunch of the magic that is going to happen in bitcoin <laughs> and then right. we are going to get step root right so okay so to explain it um, let's start with the basic idea of the snort signatures because yes, that's please. simpler I think okay. I heard of Snore signatures back in 2018. Uh, so now it's three years later. Yes, please explain. Yes. So the story starts in 1980s. Okay. Okay. So the Snore signature is a digital signature algorithm. Right. Uh, a digital signature is a data that a holder of a private key can produce. So if you are ha- have a private key corresponding to a public key. then right. with that private key you can sign any kind of message any kind of data and right. anybody in the internet can, with the signature and the public key can verify that the only person who has the knowledge of that private key that the secret is able to produce this particular signature amazing so that amazing. signature basically determines your ownership right so right. just like we write signature on our check to make ownership like this check came from me in the same way in bitcoin transaction we make a signature that specifies the ownership that this transaction came from the right owner right got it okay so right now bitcoin uses the signature algorithm called ecdsa digital signature algorithm mm-hmm. okay and this signature algorithm has been used extensively throughout all the other infrastructures or banking apps and all these things and this thing called snort signature was even created before this ecdsa digital signature came up so professor uh, snort uh, peter claus snort i guess snort i guess that's his name so he in- invented this signature algorithm but unfortunately he patented it okay and because of his patent people wasn't able to use that signature algorithm so this thing okay <laughs> yes so the signature algorithm has been lying idle in our open source literature for like last 30 years right and nobody has been able to use it because there was a patent okay uh, interestingly the patent got expired in 2008 so before satoshi wrote the bitcoin software right, right. so when satoshi actually wrote the software he could have used snort signature but he didn't Um, the reason is because it was patented there wasn't enough open source code available that satoshi could use right also so also to you know ensure that the the code is verified and it has no loopholes or back doors right. or something like that right and uh, the way we do that in cryptographic things is we, basically we say like what is the most used up algorithm in the market yeah. so <laughs> whichever algorithm people are putting mo- putting more use into that has the highest amount of monetary stake so if right. that thing gets broken so we everybody immediately knows like this thing gets broken okay got it so <laughs> so so that's why satoshi gave, uh, went on with ecdsa signature algorithm because, because it was already developed there was already open source code available right. people were already using it 
but snort signatures are better snort signatures right. are better in the sense like snort signatures are more simple and snort signature has one more magical property that ecdsa signatures doesn't have that is homomorphism that okay. means you can add two signatures together and that will also produce a valid signature wow okay. yes so how does that help yeah i i'm sure you're getting into that sorry i just got a little more excited yeah <laughs> how does it help <laughs> it, it it helps in lot of ways for example one obvious way it helps is like suppose you are doing some multi signature scheme right so you will give a signature i will give a signature those two signatures will be combined in some way and then the signature verification will take place interesting okay got right. it right Right now, how we do it in Bitcoin when we try, try to do multi-signature, we have two different signatures specific uh, corresponding to two different parties, and okay. these two signatures are a separate chunk of data that put okay. inside the Bitcoin transaction, and the algorithm can and verify. And each one is uh, verified like individually. Individually, right? Yeah. So with Snor, what you can do is like you can send me your signature, I can get my signature, I can add it together and produce one single signature. and that will be verified against your public key plus my public key so if people yeah. know your public key people know my public key they can sum it up together and they can verify that the summed up signature validates against the summed up public key amazing okay <laughs> so this makes multi signatures much more easier so uh, suppose in in case of like two uh, party multi signature you have two signatures right each signature is 64 bytes so 2 times 64 is 128 bytes yeah in in uh, and you can easily see if there are five parties then there are five signatures five times 64 uh, 64 bits that much amount of data that has to go into a bitcoin transaction with snort signature right. all that can be compressed into one single signature right so mm-hmm. that that is a huge cost uh, cost saving benefit so there are lots of other magic that can be done with snort <laughs> signature because of its homomorphic property one of, one of them is uh, um atomic swaps different kinds of then there are uh, uh, adapter signatures that can use some kind of like weird tricks that we call scriptless scripts so yeah. these are all the specific upgrades that has people cooked up like as a concept over the last 10 10 years but they couldn't apply it because ecdsa wasn't homomorphic now that we have a signature scheme that is homomorphic all these cool features that are waiting in the pipeline that can come into bitcoin without any more changes right so that's Amazing. exciting on its own that is that is and i'm i'm guessing that whatever work that you will go on to do with the bitcoin open source this would like ease it a lot right for you as well to start building on top of it uh not exactly i am not a wallet developer it will ease up the things much more for wallet developers who are building things for application layer it makes our job harder because we need to cook up the protocol and we need to cook up all the apis that the wallet developers has to use right okay but then in general um in general this implementation what do you think will be the next uh, immediate impact that is going to come into place right like with respect to massive adoption i don't think there will be an immediate impact out of it okay. because uh, it will take some time for the wallet ecosystem to catch up with this new technology for the apis to develop for uh, people like me and other people has to come up with all these wallet developer tools that the wallet developers can use instead of like banging their head like figuring out what snort signature is on their own so it will take some time to get the ecosystem developed but once it's developed i guess we will see a lot of things that uh, we do not see in the crypto space anywhere else okay. uh, because bitcoin is the first protocol that is using a homomorphic signature algorithm there is no other protocol that uses a homomorphic signature so uh, okay so uh, so this will open up a lot of new possibilities and what exactly they will look like that's anybody's guess uh, people are excited about lot of stuff there are n- new kind of dlcs that can be done uh, there are new kind of like uh, smart contracting systems that can be done more complicated and more 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 expressive right. now coming to smart contract so this is what taproot comes in so taproot is this so before going into taproot let's recap and talk about bitcoin basics okay so in bitcoin what we have is an address right an address is think of an address as a container a imaginary container where coins are held 
So when you say to your wallet, like I want to receive some coin, the wallet will generate you an address. Okay. Right. And, and, and that address in that Bitcoin protocol will be represented like a container that you will send to the sender and the sender can throw some sats in, inside that container. Once right. the sat is inside that container, that sat is yours. Why? Okay. Because that container uh, encumbered with your public key, like the address that, uh, that, that can be opened only with the private key that you have corresponding to that address that your wallet software contains, right? So once there are some sats inside the container, you can then open that container and do whatever you want with that sats. You can send right. it to some place, you can destroy it, whatever it is, whatever it is. So these are the containers. So, and there are different kinds of containers in Bitcoin. Right. So one of the very simple, and, and, and you can see this container different kinds by looking at the address. There are addresses that starts with number one. Yes. There are one address. Then there are address that starts with number three. There are three, these are called three addresses. And then there are addresses that starts with a letter called BC1. These are called SegWit addresses. Yes. So, so these are different kinds of containers and these containers uh, can do different, different things. For example, the one type address, the one type container is very simple container. There is no smart contract, there is no fancy stuff. It's just a public key. And whoever has the secret of that public key can open that container and spend that coin. Yeah. Right. right. The three type uh, containers, the three type address, these are called P2SH addresses. P2SH means this container is not just a simple public key. This container, the lock of that container is a smart contract. Right. Meaning it's a puzzle itself. So you can create any kind of puzzle, whatever kind of puzzle you can think of, some kind of mathematical puzzle and all. And if that puzzle can be solved with another part of data, that becomes the signature of the, or the opening or the key for that container. So think of it like the container is locked by some puzzle and then you have a key that can open up that lock. Right. Simple. Amazing. Okay. Right. So, so when we say that one private key can create multiple public addresses, it's this three type of addresses, right? Not the one container. No, 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 no. You can create That's any kind of container, infinite numbers of it, not infinite, but a large number of it. Right. Yeah. So no, one as private key, you can create multiple addresses of any type. Of any type. Okay. You can create one, you can create three, you can create BC1 type. BC1. Okay. Got it. Right. Right. So, uh, with Taproot, we will have one more new type of container. We will okay. call this P2TR, P2 Taproot, and this will basically start with, I, I don't know, BC2 or PTR or something like that. I have to check the specification, what, what will be the string that will <laughs> identify this thing. It's, it's not that important as of now. <laughs> yes. So, um, so the user, uh, when Taproot gets up, upgrade, up, updated, the user doesn't have to do anything. If the wallet supports it, the wallet will give you an option to create this P2TR type of addresses, just like a SegWit wallet gives you an option to create a BC1 address to receive coins. Interesting. Right. Okay. So the wallet will be able to give you a P2TR address to receive coins. Now, what is this P2TR container? So in Bitcoin, we know that the smart contracting system is not very express. We cannot create a very huge, complex smart contract like we can do in Ethereum on Bitcoin, because yeah. there are certain limitations. There are certain limitations how big the script can be. There are certain limitations how many script operations can be inside, and there is no loop. So it's not Turing complete. So one of the major way people, uh, the developers were thinking about solving this problem is how about how to increase the complexity of this smart contracting system on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So. You can think of a complex smart contract like a tree of logics. Mm -hmm. For example, you can say a container can be locked if X happens or Y happens or Z happens or A happens or B happens or C happens, a lot of, lot of branches like that. Like, like it's an if else branch like that. If this thing happens, then open it, open the lock in this way. If that thing happens, then open the lock in that right. way. All these ways. So, so if you try to make a very 
complex smart contracting system with this simple if all clause if else clause like if you try to write a simple python code you will see like this if else clause gets really big exactly. right and and it will be a big if else clause and right now the way to open the lock of a container in the bitcoin system is like when you are sent when you are getting the container the container doesn't have the lock itself when you are spending the container like when you are opening it up you have to tell the bitcoin protocol what was the lock the script that was locking it the entire full script so you can think like if there if your container is locked by a very big script then the entire big script has to go inside the transaction that is spending from that container okay yeah that would be very that, bad like <laughs> that is very bad at this moment for example so if you have a lightning channel so lightning channels are basically multi sig container a container where the money is held by two parties together simultaneously and if you want to close the multi sig you have you have closed the channel you have to publish the entire lock script of that multi sig transaction we call this htlc hash time lock contract and it's quite a big chunk of contract data so all that data has to go inside the spending transaction in order to close a lightning channel right right so tap root containers will be this special kind of containers where each if else clause will be separated in the way such a way that whenever you are trying to open the container corresponding to a specific clause you only have to disclose that part of the clause not other part of the clause Okay. So your entire script can have like hundred different clauses of opening the container, and suppose you have decided to open the container with the fifth clause of it, you only publish to the Bitcoin network the fifth clause, mm. and that's it, and that opens the container, and nobody will ever know like how many clauses were other than that was there in the lock script itself. Wow. so okay so the entire script that you have created in order to lock the container gets hidden even when you are spending it wow so that's a privacy benefit right interesting yes and another uh, small thing is like this tap root container will also have a simple way of opening it that we call the tap root pub key so if the tap root pub key signature is provided then it the entire transaction looks like a normal one address transaction output like a public key gets a signature verifies the public key against the signature opens the lock nobody knows how many extra complexities are there so every transaction every after tap root output will have this option of like opening via a single pub key so hey. so you can you can think of this situation like there is a company board of like 20 people and they have like very complex encumbered smart contracting system in order to like uh, in order to cover up all the possible different scenarios that can happen in order to unlock this coin but in regular cases when nothing emergency is happening the regular app uh, the regular spend will simply be like this first public key spend like yeah. everybody will agree to create the public key signature that signature will go into it and if, and and then then in the network it will just look like a p2p cage transaction right. so nobody will know what is the what is behind the scenes with this particular yes. spending right yes uh, amazing okay uh, is that all or there is more because i have some questions uh i think that's more that, that, that's all and uh, that's all that that's covered the basic of this what this tap root thing is going to do amazing okay that was very well explained man thank you so much rat like i i can i can see myself you know trying to visualize what you are saying um and i can i can put it in the picture like okay what this is how it is working right now the real question is that see for for a majority of the people it doesn't matter whether we whether the exchange uses a one one address or three address or a, or a segwit or back to back 32 i think that's also what it's called right uh, yes. address but the the user learning that there is something happening with bitcoin core the question really is that will it affect the way they are transacting will it affect their exchange their wallet right so can you explain if it will or it will not and what they need to do so first of all as a user if your interface to bitcoin is going to be an exchange then nothing happening in the bitcoin protocol is going to affect you 
So you basically don't have Bitcoin. You have an IOU of an exchange website. So it's up to the exchange what they are going to display or what kind of functionalities they are going to expose to you. So it's not up to you, and you basically don't have any exposure to the Bitcoin protocol itself, mm-hmm. right? So um, and second of all, um, the exchange don't really have much of benefits of taproot addresses because this kind of uh, this kind of elaborate smart contracting things will not be of any use for an exchange business, right? Unless they are doing their for their own fund, for their own corpus of the fund, they are trying to lock it up and for their own thing. But if you try to withdraw from an exchange, they will simply spend you to one one address P2P PKH because that's going to cost less. That and you don't have to like they don't have to like bother about all this technical part also. So I don't think exchanges will be the first one to have it. Um, what we will probably have is uh, Lightning wallets and multi-signature wallets that will use this smart contract, this uh, taproot facilities to create better and more private smart contracting system. Right. So if a user uses Lightning Wallet and if a user uses some kind of smart uh, uh, multi-signature wallet, so that's where I think this thing will probably hit first. Uh, in the user experience, they a user will not have to be bothered about all this part of this thing. So um, unless he himself is trying to craft his own smart contract and trying to create his own policies and all that. The crux of the question actually was that whether whether or not they have to make any changes. And I don't think that from what you're saying that a user, whether what, whether they're using an exchange or a wallet, they probably have to do nothing, right? Nothing. Whatever they're doing, right. they just keep doing it. Everything is yes. happening in the backside and all the developers yes. are taking care of it. Yes, yes. So, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, uh, so when uh, this happened with SegWit also, so when SegWit came up, the question was like, if I have a non-SegWit wallet, can I send from that non-SegWit wallet yeah. to a SegWit address? Right. So many wallets didn't support it seg- sending to SegWit address as such. Right. But sending to SegWit address was basically easier part than spending from a SegWit address because yeah. The spending from part requires understanding what a SegWit address is, understanding how to create a valid SegWit transaction. But if you are sending to SegWit address, it just basically say uh, your wallet software basically needs to change in a way that it can handle sending to a new kind of address. So that will be easier. So well, just like SegWit, have, in, in case of SegWit, here also you will have like non-taproot wallets. First, will have this capability of sending to taproot addresses. Then slowly there will be capabilities associated with sending from tap to tap. Right. So there is also one thing I want to mention here for regular users, like people sending from one public key to another public key, tap root doesn't give much benefit. In fact, it yeah. gets more costly to do that than normal secret address. So if you are just okay. sending for coins from one address to another address, you better you are better, better off. Better use a non tap root address. Yes, better use a SegWit address because that's going to be cheaper. That's the that's benefits cheap. of Taproot comes in only when the complexity of the smart contracts get bigger. Right. Can we do we expect some decentralized finance happening on Bitcoin now with the new Taproot update? Like you know. No, no. Uh, but we we expect decentralized finance happening on Bitcoin, but not associated with Taproot. I, those part of the things will happen more from the liquid network and the side chain ecosystem right. of the things. Because there you have the total expressibility and the expression of smart contracts and all those things that you okay. need. Sorry. So essentially, Taproot is an upgrade just to ease the complicated transactions, make them faster with lesser cost. Right? Yes. And, and, and to open up possibilities of creating much more complex smart contracts in the Bitcoin protocol itself. Right. So that will create some new kind of like, uh, once you have extra smart contracting, you will obviously have some kind of like phi part of it coming into it, but it will not be like the yield farming thing that we have. Right. Let, let's, let me, <laughs> let me, uh, you know, understand it. Like we believe, some of us believe that the Bitcoin is an investment that you should hold for a long term to see its value. Right. Let's say, is there a possibility that I create a smart contract, which is like time locked or block locked, right? Like we say that after 200,000 blocks, 
release this bitcoin or send this bitcoin to this particular address until that time keep them in the container can something like this happen this already happens right now. Oh, this, <laughs> uh, this doesn't need tap root so uh, lightning network works like that so htlc's hash time lock contract is basically a time lock contract so it's a contract where the coins are locked in a address for a certain amount of time so yeah. so this kind of things already happen happen right now but uh, the thing is like the the reason why we can't do like the ethereum style of like token system or like dapps on top of bitcoin is because basically bitcoin doesn't have the loops right yeah. without the loops you cannot have this iterative process running inside a smart contract doing fancy stuff right and th there is a problem of this loop that's why we don't do it in bitcoin that's a different discussions but that that that's the basic reason why we don't have so uh, also explain to me i'm not sure how much you are aware of this but bitcoin cash has op code codes right op codes um, and and they allow smart contracts in a some certainly different way what is how do you compare if you do and what do you think about it yeah so uh op codes are nothing new op codes exist in bitcoin since day one so, okay, so i am i am being the noob here right <laughs> yeah, i yeah. have three so, meme so, materials already from this video where i have put across <laughs> a point and have been trashed into the ground rapidly you know with this jack hammer on my head like oh, no 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 okay go on sir <laughs> yeah so um so what bitcoin cash did is basically uh it's a interesting story and it's a little bit side track also uh when satoshi created bitcoin he had a bunch of op codes right op codes are basically operations like get two numbers add them together get two numbers multiply them together have a public key have a signature verify them together right okay. these are op codes so he he has some around 150 140 op codes or something like that and many of those op codes were basically uh later uh, these allowed because they had some security vulnerabilities so as stupid as bitcoin cash people are they decided to open up this some kind of like vulnerable op codes and say like this opens up new kind of smart contracts into the system that bitcoin doesn't have so yeah that's what they have been doing uh, we have been the community have been battling with this false information for like for, what no four years now and <laughs> and so yeah uh in bit bitcoin cash and bsv you will find out like they have this extra kind of smart con uh, op codes that do extra kind of things but most of the time those extra things are not in bitcoin because people figured out like it's not a smart thing to do got it um interesting okay uh, does this so tell me like the snore signature right they've completely replaced the esdc eh? no 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 it's it will be backward compatible so so okay. that so that so this tap root container will be opened via this smart snort right all so the other kind of containers will use the new signature but yes but the uh, the legacy system will keep on working yes the legacy system will keep on working all the uh, segwit address and the p2pkh and p2sh address they will open up via the ecds signature but so so uh, if i want to use snort signatures on these addresses i can't i can only use it on tap root yes yes okay. you can only use it on tap so essentially we've just added a, co a completely new feature onto the network and which is independently working along yes. with the uh, yes. rest of the network okay yes Understood. so that's the concept of like backward compatibility we don't want to disrupt existing things that are already working yeah. so we are just you know spreading the wings and slowly adding components yes. to it and so, yes. the old things keep on running properly yes amazing okay so uh this is a soft fork as we were saying so basically it means that no changes are required there is nothing mandatory for anybody to change on the system right no miners yes. no traders no wallet holders no exchanges nothing nobody has to do anything with it right right um as long as they they want to so what do you think uh, the last question from me is that what do you think about uh, taproot yourself like your own opinion on it uh, being an open source developer and being with bitcoin for quite some time yeah i think it, it, it's 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 it has been cooking for a long time now so people have created the concept of taproot and it comes with the previous concept of graphroot and uh, they had this idea of like uh, hiding the complexity of the smart contract 
in such a way that people don't get to know what the full contract is. Also, the spending conditions and the cost of doing the spend can be lower than that. Nice. So instead of having the big full contract published in the network in the time of spending, you can like only publish a sp specific chunk of it that opens up the lock. So did this uh, this all this is a scalability uh, improvement. This is a privacy improvement, and this is a smart contract improvement, right? So a lo lot of lot of extra capabilities are going to push on onto this thing. So. That's why the community is rightfully so very much excited and people have been waiting for it for so many years. Uh, Greg Maxwell, I think, like uh, get the con uh, described the concept of it in 2017 and it took us almost four years to properly flesh it out and then finally got it. Uh, we are lucky because we got it a little bit sooner because of this uh, speedy trial way of doing uh, soft fork. Otherwise, it would have been next year, right? Oh, so okay. So yeah, so uh, Taproot is coming, getting locked in in November. It's not locked in yet. Uh, it will be locked in. It's guaranteed to be locked in in November. And uh, after that, we will have this slow ascending graph of like getting the adoption curve up and see what kind of cool functions the wallet developers come up with. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Raj, for explaining that so simply, so lucidly. Uh, even a dumb person like me understood it. <laughs> <laughs> you are not dumb. Uh, you are quite smart. Uh, you have been fighting this in this space and fighting through this intellectual jargons for a long time now. I I say that that I'm dumb so that people like you can praise me and you know I get like a nice little boost. <laughs> Good strategy over there. Yeah. So that's why uh, just smart, right? Um, all right. Uh, Raj, all the best for uh, you know the the new career that you've taken up with uh, open source development. For the people who are watching Raj for the first time, uh, he is the first person who received the grant from uh, Square for open source Bitcoin development. First person from India, and we've done an extensive interview and what his future plans are. So please, the link is in the description. Please go check out that video. Thank you, Raj, for explaining uh, Taproot. Uh, and we'll see you again soon on uh, CoinCrunch. Yep. Thanks for having me, man. Talk to you later. Later. Bye.